I'm home again. And it is wonderful to be home after three weeks worth of travel through the harsh European summer to return to the sunshine at home. Uh, <laughs> jokes aside, actually not such a good week to talk about sunshine here because it has been unusually rainy. So I have been indoors doing a combination of recovering from jet lag, always fun. That takes me a good solid week on the way home. Uh, looking after the kids because my wife managed to time her conference uh, down in Sydney sort of single digit hours after I landed back in the country here. Not so good there time wise. Uh, and to top it off school holidays as well, which has been awesome. Great seeing the kids, but like this combination of things uh, all combined together has made things a little bit tricky. Now, that said, uh, what do you do to amuse the kids when they have school holidays? You teach them to code. And I've been doing little bits and pieces of coding with my kids for a few years now. Uh, so my son is eight, my daughter is five, and I have posted things before about uh, how I've been teaching my son, because he was a little bit older. So uh, he's been using a, a Lenovo Yoga, which does the flip thing, and it's got the touch screen, which is really awesome for kids. And one of the things that uh, I thought I'd talk about, which was really interesting this week, is that now that my daughter's getting old enough to sort of start to, to read a bit and understand what she's doing, I've had her uh, doing some coding on code.org as well. And the, the reason why I'm mentioning it today, I'm just looking at the, the tweet I wrote now. Uh, a few days ago, I put out a tweet, uh, which was just a little video of my daughter doing some coding on code.org. Uh, and, and she's a five-year-old kid, so she's cute, <laughs> which always helps. But she's sort of, I'm looking at the video on the screen now, she's kind of dragging uh, blocks around, they're code blocks they use on code.org. And, and the, the way it's laid out is I've sort of got uh, a, a little sort of map on one side with a character, so she was doing the Angry Birds one, and you've got to move the character around the map. Uh, and to move the character, you can move forward as one command, move left, move right, etc. cetera. Uh, there's while loops as well you can drop stuff into, so I drop sort of sequences of commands in. And then they sort of do all the commands on the other side of the screen, they drag the blocks up. So, you know, move forward, move forward, move left, move forward, move right, etc. So she's doing it in this video. Uh, and she's going, this is easy, this is easy. And interestingly, this, uh, this tweet I made, the, the video has been viewed as of the moment, 45 second video, uh, 20,500 times. Uh, liked 782 times, which is really cool. And it's, it's just been fun to see the comments where people have just been really enthusiastic about seeing a kid get into coding uh, and enjoying it. And she's actually come to me in the past and said, look, Daddy, can we please do some coding? Which, of course, brings a tear to your eye. So I'm going to share that tweet later on because it's just super cool. And if, if you've got kids, I, I think probably it's a bit hard much younger than that. But from that age upwards... Give them a go at stuff like code.org. Uh, my son's been using Code Combat as well, which is super cool because it's got like ogres and fire and stuff like this. Uh, also cool because it's actually object orientated and you've got to do things like get lines of code in the right order, but it's effectively got IntelliSense as well to help you write the code. So he's been doing things like, uh, I forget the exact syntax, but it's like whilst ogre is still alive, find nearest ogre, attack ogre, and put them in a while loop. So you just keep attacking ogres all the way over the place. These are really, really good building blocks. And I reckon that's a fantastic thing for kids to learn. Uh, during this <laughs> school holiday period, I've been having some good chats with my son because as an eight-year-old, he's, he's very inquisitive now. So even today, sort of driving, uh, driving home from dropping my daughter off, we're sort of talking about what was he saying? He's saying somewhere he'd heard computers don't lie. Yeah, and, he, and he said, yeah, that's silly. Computers can lie. And I'm sort of saying, well, yeah, c computers don't lie. They, they follow instructions, but sometimes we screw up the instructions and we have bugs and things. And that kind of led to the discussion about all the computers in the car because there's computers for the speed, there's computers to control the fuel injection, computers for everything, and all of it's got code. So it's really cool to, to sort of see a very uh, organic interest in code coming out. Now, um, because inevitably when I share something with kids coding, I get messages along the lines of kids should be kids. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Uh, if you're saying they should go outside and play more, they're, 
they're both going to run in the Gold Coast Marathon on the weekend, not the whole marathon, the children. But the, like the kids' fun run, like we spend so much time outdoors uh, because that's very much the lifestyle here, that that is, is frankly just a ridiculous statement to make. And even if they didn't, if this is something that kids are doing and they're enjoying, then that is very fantastically good and it sure as hell beats sitting in front of the TV. All right, so I'm going to share the link to that tweet because that is awesome. I would love you to share it if it is something that helps other people see that kids can enjoy this and it's easy to do. All right, that was number one. Now, pwned passwords. I keep coming back to pwned passwords. This keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So I, I think I shared in one of the recent updates, I said, look, the, uh, the traffic... I'm trying to remember the chronology. The traffic was regularly hitting a million requests a day. Uh, and then it jumped very, very suddenly, went up to 4 million requests a day, constantly 4 million requests. And then it sort of got to the point, and I'm going to pull up the latest stats here so I get my figures right. It got to the point where uh, I noticed just over the last week, really, it was hitting uh, 8 million requests a day. And if I go and jump into Pwned Passwords, now, I'm looking at my Cloudflare dashboard and my analytics. Uh, last 24 hours, eight, basically 8.5 million, 8,582,298 8, requests. And it's just, it's just growing at a really fierce rate. And, you know, like this is fantastic. I love building stuff that, that goes big uh, because it's just fun to sort of see things scale and grow. And it's also sort of fulfilling to see something that's actually used for good. So I thought yesterday I really should do the stats. Uh, I should do the money stats. I need to look at how much this thing is costing me. Now, this is fun. I like doing the money stats. I, I'm actually going to find the series of tweets here. I, I should have maybe been a bit more organized about getting my things in a line before I started this, but uh, jet lag. <laughs> um, also, I'm actually recording this on a Thursday. I'm recording it a day earlier. And this is a, th a Thursday in the future too, because we're in Australia. Recording it a day earlier because uh, my wife will actually get back tonight. And I kind of want to spend my Friday maybe seeing her. And uh, yeah, geez, it's been nearly a month by the time I factor in my trip as well. All right, so here's the stats. Now, I put out a series of tweets. I will link to them in the notes for this blog post as well. So that the first thing was, over the last week, I'd seen 54 million requests go through Cloudflare infrastructure. Now, the cool thing is, of the 54 million requests, 92% of them were served from Cloudflare cache. Now, in fact, I'll, I'll sort of share a few things that aren't in the tweet stream because I've established them since. So 92% of requests served from Cloudflare cache. That has a dramatic impact on the cost of running the service because that's 92% of requests that I don't need to serve from the infrastructure on the Azure side. Put that the other way, I only have to serve about 8% of requests. So it's almost like the cost is about, what's that, about 1 12th or something like that. Uh, so that makes a massive difference. Now, people said to me, a few people today, they're like, yeah, but what, you know, what does Cloudflare cost? I know that they're supporting pwned passwords and they're giving you the service, but if you had to pay for it, what would Cloudflare cost? So I pinged uh, Jinad Ali, the guy who helped do the K-anonymity model uh, that's so essential to the way this service runs, pinged him on Twitter this morning and I said, look, this is actually a good question. Uh, of the services you're giving me, if, if we had to compare what you're giving me now versus what anyone can go and get for free, what would be different? Uh, so, you know, would we still get the same level of cacheability? And, and what we brought it down to is that the cache hit ratio may be a bit lower uh, and that's largely due to Argo, which is the smart traffic routing. So this is the Cloudflare feature which says, hey, like the, the most direct route between uh, a Cloudflare node, so say my Cloudflare node in Brisbane would be the closest to me, the most direct route between that and the origin server, which is over in West US, maybe that's not the most efficient route. Maybe we should go a different way because of network congestion, reliability, uh, greater latency, whatever it may be. So Argo is like smart routing. And that also gives us a higher cacheability. This is based on my chat this morning. So, you know, yes, Argo does help. Argo costs $5 a month. 
<laughs> so, so remember this, as I go through the figures, we may need to inflate the pricing by $5 a month if you need to figure out what would happen if you're actually paying for Cloudflare. So, 92%. Uh, now, uh, of those, so because Cloudflare dealt with 92% of the traffic, Azure, and remember all of Pwned passwords on the Origin server runs on Azure Functions, that only had to support 4 million requests. So now we're dealing with 4 million requests. Now, it's done that in an average time of under 30 milliseconds, 29.9 milliseconds, just to be clear. 50th percentile of 22 milliseconds. So now we're saying that only 8% of requests go all the way through to the origin. There's a 50-50 chance it's going to execute in less than 22 milliseconds. That's a good time. My failure count out of the 4 million requests to the origin over the last week is zero. Good number. Happy with zero. So re remember, like in, in real context, that is zero requests out of 54 million have failed. Happy with that. Over the last week, the service consumed 84 billion function execution units. So th this now gets to the, the, the cost side of things because Azure Functions bills you on, on two metrics. Uh, and one of those metrics is function execution units. Function execution units are measured in bytes, kilobytes, gigabytes, whatever, per time unit. So in this case, it's 84 billion. I've got to make sure I get the, the, the units right here. 84 billion bytes per millisecond. And this is effectively how much memory are you using for how long? This is a really, really neat mechanism to charge some sort of consumption-based resource computing on. And to qualify what I mean by that term, when we go and get something like a platform as a service model, say it's it's IIS as a service, which is effectively what the app service that the main Have I Been Pwned site runs on, I get effectively my own virtual, I keep saying effectively, what is literally my own virtual machine. And my virtual machine has a certain amount of CPU and RAM and capacity and everything, and it's, it's like a, a box. And I can execute within that box. And if I start getting to the limit of it, I need to add another box. And then I'm not using much of that box, and then gradually traffic ramps up and use more of it. So when we think about the, the value proposition of cloud and how we moved away from all the on-prem stuff, where we had to buy all this stuff that we didn't use just in case we needed to, that's massively better in the PaaS model, but we've still got this box that has capacity that doesn't get used. The really neat thing about Azure Functions, which remember is serverless computing, runs on servers, but they call it serverless because you no longer have a concept of the box, not in a consumption model anyway. The really neat thing about serverless computing is you're really just paying per execution unit. So how much resources are being consumed? So. If you can make things run faster or more efficiently, it has an immediately direct impact on your price. And when you're running at an average of less than 30 milliseconds, that's very, very fast. So 84 billion function execution units, that's one vector which you get charged on. The other vector you get charged on is the number of execution times. So what is the total count? Total count is 4 million. Keep those numbers in mind. I've also got 67 gigabytes worth of blob storage. Now remember, I optimized Pwn passwords by taking everything that was in table storage and putting them into blobs. Doesn't always make sense to put stuff in blobs. This made sense because first of all, blobs are much faster to serve from storage than what table storage is to query. So remember that speed is important because that impacts the function execution units. So uh, the blobs are very, very fast to serve from storage. The nature of Pwn passwords is that they're going to change once every three, four, five months, however frequently I update it. Plus, there's only 16 to the power of five different SHA-1 prefixes. Remember the five character SHA-1 prefix. If this sounds weird, go back and read about Pwn passwords and K-anonymity. So there's only just over a million unique files sitting in blob storage. The function can just pick them up and return them. That consumes 67 gigabytes worth of data. There's also, actually that 67 gigabytes also includes the downloadable hash sets. So if you just want to download all this and not call an API, 
that's also part of the 67 gig. Plus, there's a bit of stuff that, uh, or a bit of storage that I used in the in the preparation of this data, which I could delete. I'm just really, really super cautious because like it's all working. Don't touch anything. I should be able to delete some stuff. I actually took a couple of goes to upload all the blob storage and I renamed some things on the way. So I can reduce that data. Uh, I'm reading it on each function call, which is four million times a week. So when we talk about blob storage, we pay for the gigabytes stored, so that the volume of data, and we we'll also pay for the number of times it is read, written to, queried, whatever it may be. And when I say queried, if you get like a, a listing of blobs. So there's another metric we pay money on. Now bandwidth, pay money on bandwidth as well. Everything's got a cost. But you know, taking a step back for a moment, this is sort of the, the, the joy of cloud done well, where everything does have a cost in very fine units. And if you can start to control how many of those units you use, and reduce them at all the right points, you have a lot of power over what you actually pay. And you're gonna see that number in a moment. So bandwidth, I need to pay for everything egress from Azure. Some people think I say Azure funny. I think it's just Americans. I don't know. <laughs> you know what I mean, Azure uh, to Cloudflare. So when that function is called and data leaves the Azure data center and goes to Cloudflare, that's egress data. That's bandwidth, you gotta pay for that. Uh, now, my average response size from Pwn Passwords is about 14 kilobytes. This is a really rough back of the napkin uh, test. And basically, I just went and loaded it multiple times over and I was like, yeah, it's about 14 kilobytes. Now, uh, that 14 kilobytes, I've got to pay for 4 million times a week because that's how often a call has to go from Cloudflare back to the function. So, boiling all the numbers down, let's have a look at what the cost is. My execution units, so my 84 billion megabytes per millisecond is actually about 82,000 gigabytes per second. I'm gonna to link to this thread and you will actually see the spreadsheet. So I'm doing uh, 82,000 gigabytes per second in a week. Now, I started off doing everything in a week because the last week has just been by far the biggest, but a lot of Azure stuff is calculated by month. And part of the reason it's calculated by month is that there are free monthly grants. Now, everyone gets this. If you go to the pricing calculator, you'll see. So for example, there is a free monthly grant of 400,000 gigabyte seconds for Azure Functions. I, pro rata, over the last week, am using a monthly amount of 362,000 gigabyte seconds, i.e. beneath the free grant. So the Azure function based on the gigabyte seconds being used is actually free. So my cost is nothing. The function execution count, I'm doing just over 4 million a week, which is almost 18 million a month. There's a free grant of 1 million, so I do have to pay, except the price per million is 20 cents. So I'm paying $3.35 for Azure functions per month. So remember that, we're up to $3.35. Now blob storage, blob storage, I've got that 67 gigabytes, you pay 2.08 cents per gigabyte, which brings the grand total to $1.40. So now add $1.40 on. You're gonna see a theme here about really low prices. Blob reads, now I am doing, in terms of blob reads, why is that number so high? I'm doing 17 million, <laughs> I think my figure's too high. Oh, no, no, it's per month. So I'm doing 17.7 .7 million blob reads per month. So this is the 4 million requests per month, is about uh, per week, is about 17.7 .7 million per month. You pay 0.44 cents per 10,000, add another $7.81 from the blob reads. Now here's the big one. This is where the big cost is, bandwidth. So bandwidth, I am using about, uh, 237 gigabytes worth of egress bandwidth a month. You get five gigabytes of egress bandwidth for free. You then pay 8.7 cents per gigabyte. Bottom line is a fraction over 20 bucks per month in bandwidth. Like that's the big number, the $20 per month in bandwidth. Bottom line is $32.75 per month, $7.40 per week. Like this is insane. 
I am, when you, you bundle it all back up and go, what's actually going through Cloudflare? I'm doing 54 million queries. Did I put that in the month? Yes, this is the back to the weekly figures. 54 million queries a week, and it's costing $7.40 a week to run this thing. And that's 54 million queries executing, particularly with the Cloudflare stuff, in what is often about 18 milliseconds. So EVE Online uh, found on their stats, they were getting an average of 18 milliseconds. Searching through half a billion records. Like this is... This is insane. And then I actually left a, um, uh, another tweet after this. I said, supporter donations, welcome to help me bear the brunt of this overhead. And I put one of the like little crying, laughing, smiley faces because I thought it was funny. And then I got a lot of donations. So I think I've had enough donations to run this service at a cost of $7.40 per week, kind of forever. <laughs> like, so thank you very much for everyone that did kick in a little bit of money. Now, uh, this, this has actually led to, to two really interesting discussions out of this, or, or two, I guess, categories of feedback. One category of feedback is people have gone, power of cloud, isn't this awesome? If you can architect things the right way and make the most of the services that you can use cost effectively, this is awesome. And, and honestly, I'm just, just, like, I'm just happy that it's gone so well. The other category of feedback was, yes, it was very cheap, but how much time did it cost you? Uh, and, and in all seriousness, like that's where the cost is. It's many, many, many weeks worth of effort that's gone into this uh, in, the, in terms of the collection of the data and then distilling it down to unique passwords, processing it, uploading it over Australian bandwidth. That was painful. I would have paid more to my telco just to upload the bloody data in the first place because our connection's so crap, I have to drop back to 4G to do it, than what I've paid for running the entire thing at massive scale across the world. <laughs> it tells you something about Aussie bandwidth. But anyway, that's, uh, that's Pwn Passwords. I'm just super stoked at how efficiently that's running. And I'll try and write more about uh, the cost breakdown, particularly as it gets larger. And, and what's going to happen as it gets larger is that the Cloudflare case hit ratio will improve because some of the yet uh, less utilized edge nodes around the world will get more traffic. Case hit ratio will go up. Uh, I suspect that, look, in, in all seriousness, if it costs 10 times this and it's costing me $10 a day, I don't care, like I'm still going to run it. But I bet you 10 times as much traffic is not going to cost 10 times as many dollars. It's going to be something more like, I don't know, five times as many dollars because I'll go from 92% hit ratio to 96 or 7 or something like that. Time will tell. I will share the figures as and when they're available. All right, that's that stuff. Let me get into the blogging because there's been... Uh, it's been something massively, massively major this week, which I alluded to in my weekly update last week from the other side of the world, which is uh, Mozilla Firefox and 1Password integrating with Have I Been Pwned. And I want to tell you the story about this because it's always more interesting on the camera. There's a bit of personality. Last year, Mozilla built in the, the list of breached websites uh, into Firefox. So there was an ability to say, hey, I'm on the Adobe website. Uh, Adobe has had a data breach. Isn't that interesting? You know, maybe now I'll change my password or, or do whatever it is. And geez, if you haven't changed your Adobe password by now, you're going to have issues. So they built that in. And I, I remember I was, in, um, I was in Rockhampton in Australia when the announcement came out. Now, Rockhampton is a place sort of in, uh, it's not completely in the middle of nowhere. It's a regional centre, but it's further north in Queensland. It's the kind of place you go where they've got signs next to the river saying, don't go in the river, there's crocodiles. So, so I was feeling, you know, very outback Australia. And it was interesting. I was suddenly getting all these phone calls from journalists and things because of what Mozilla had done just by saying whether the site had been breached or not. And I'm sort of going, like, okay, it's cool that they've done this, but it's not like a massive thing. It's just a simple little thing. They plugged into a free API. What's the big deal? But people loved it, and they were super, super excited. So Mozilla and I were talking at the time about... Uh, the possibility further down the line of integrating Have I Been Pwned proper, and, and by proper I mean the, the email addresses, into the browser. And discussions kind of went on for quite some time and we started sort of talking about models to do that. But th their requirements were they didn't want to send me anything about the email addresses of their users. And my requirements were I wanted to protect the data and have I been pwned as best as possible? And, and we were just trying to find the right common ground. 
when I was in San Fran a few months ago, I went and visited uh, Mozilla. This was when I did my whirlwind trip of all these tech companies. Uh, and we talked again there. I did a presentation of them on, on the cybers as well, but we definitely talked about this Model 2. And it really only took until after pwned passwords had gained a lot of traction with K-anonymity, where we went, look, the, the K-anonymity model actually satisfies this. So we can do the K-anonymity <coughs> Do the K-anonymity thing, which protects the source password, passwords, email addresses, protects the source email addresses, uh, and also makes sure that I don't need to disclose data that, that I don't want to disclose. So this was great. Like This was the model. And over the last few months, we've built out the API to, to be able to query by the first six characters of a SHA-1 hash of an email address. And I explain in the blog post why that is, bigger data set. So I built out that model, uh, runs on Azure Functions. I've just spoken about how efficient Azure Functions are. And then sits on top of a different table storage table of email addresses. So Have I Been Pwned's got the 5.1 billion records, which is about 3.1 billion unique email addresses in one table. Now there's another table with a SHA-1 hash of them all. I may change data structures later on as well. I'm playing with a few ideas. But for the moment, that's how it works. So when a new breach comes in, it's putting data into both those. So um, built out that model uh, and they're good in testing it. They've been really, really helpful in helping me define uh, what that looks like. And at the same time, I was talking to one password because obviously they've integrated the pwned passwords feature. Uh, I said, look, you know, I, I think this would be a great model for, for, for one password users <laughs> like myself. Uh, so we had a chat about that and they said, yeah, look, they'd love to do that as well. So what we managed to do earlier this week is, is publish the announcement about both those parties integrating uh, Have I Been Pwned email address searches into their products in a way that protects the identity of their users. And also for me, as the operator Have I Been Pwned, protects the identities within Have I Been Pwned. This is just like wins all over the place. And I've just had so much awesomely positive feedback since I pushed this out just over 48 hours ago, uh, the announcement. And it's, um, I think I've mentioned before, I, I sort of gauge whether something is a good idea or not based on can I get like 99% positive feedback? You know, this is the bar. I want 99% of people to be happy. And the other 1% of people, they're always going to be unhappy about something. You know, <laughs> it's not necessarily my fault. But I think we're pretty much at 100%. Like maybe there's, I'm trying, I think the only people that have been unhappy haven't understood it, where they've gone, well, this is crazy. You're sending passwords to a third party. No, it's, it's not passwords. And even the pwned passwords doesn't send passwords. It's the SHA hashes and, you know, the subset of them. So uh, I, I think I could pretty safely say I've had 100% positive feedback from people that understand how it works. And a bunch of people that don't understand how it works, but they're still happy. So that's awesome. I'm stoked about that. The timeline for this is that it is in 1Password now. So if you're a 1Password user, you can go into the web version of it and see it work. They generally dog food through the web version and then they feed it through into the desktop version. That's what they did with Pwn Passwords. Uh, so I am already seeing a heap of requests come through from them executing very fast on functions. Slower than Pwn Passwords though because they are actually having to pick a petition up out of table storage. Now, Mozilla is going to begin testing shortly, initially with a quarter of a million users, and then later on rolling it out to the entire Firefox audience. That's going to be interesting. The cost is not going to be $7 a week <laughs> to, to run that. So I'm not, if I'm honest, I'm not entirely sure what it's going to be yet, but we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. So that's super cool. I'm just very, very happy about that. Very happy about all the positive press it's gotten as well. Uh, and, you know, probably more importantly than anything as well, happy, as I said in the intro of the blog post, that there's now going to be a much broader range of people who never knew that they were in data breaches or knew that data breaches were a thing that are now going to find themselves there uh, and, and I hope change behaviors in, in a positive way in terms of using a password manager, unique passwords, 2FA, all that sort of good stuff. So that's the ultimate goal. Can we drive really positive change in user behavior? I will keep you up to date with how that pans out. There's obviously going to be other big announcements this year as that rolls out, particularly to the larger Firefox audience, uh, and as it hits things like the desktop apps in 1Password too. 
So that's super cool. Now, I don't know why I do this, but <laughs> on to the next thing. Sometimes I just have an itch. You know, and it's like I, I want to write something or build something or do something and it doesn't make any sense to do it because I'm too busy and I'm looking after the kids and I'm jet lagged and my wife's away and all the other good excuses and frankly good reasons why I shouldn't do this. But I had this itch earlier this week and I think it was just literally Monday my time where I went, we really don't have a good resource for people who want to get HTTPS but don't necessarily know where to start. Now, have a think about this. The top 1 million websites at the moment, less than half of them force HTTPS. And that's the top million, right? So that's the biggest ones. Now, this is from uh, Scott Helms' stats. He does an Alexa uh, top 1 million crawl every night. Every six months, he produces a report. And in fact, just to put it in context, let's look at Scott's Alexa top 1 million from Feb. So back in Feb, Scott found that it was... 38.4% of the top 1 million websites forcing HTTPS. That number is growing at about a third every six months. So I, I reckon we must be pushing 50%, almost 50%. Or put it another way, half of them don't have it. And that number decreases dramatically as you go down the order of the top 1 million too. So the top 4,000 websites, for example, have a much greater rate of HTTPS than the bottom 4,000 in that top million. It would be interesting to see what the 1 million to 2 million range looks like in terms of adoption. I bet you it's going to be something under a quarter. It's going to be very, very small. Now, I'm particularly interested in that group, in the smaller ones, because the big guys, first of all, they've got much more complexity in terms of how they integrate HTTPS. And secondly, particularly the bigger ones like the corporate entities, etc., they've got professionals to help them do this. So the, I think the thing that got me, there was a really interesting thread this week, and it was actually from, I'm, I'm trying to think of how she described herself. It was someone in the adult entertainment industry, let's put it like that. And she was saying, look, she was going to websites where she would need to submit information about herself to the websites that she was working with. And she was seeing HTTP, not seeing HTTPS, having this argument about why transport layer security, uh, security is important, particularly in an industry like that where you're sharing sensitive information about yourself. So I, I think and this was on the public timeline. She was saying, look, she needs to submit uh, identity documents and things like that. And the thing that was striking me is that there are all these little websites that don't have HTTPS, that don't know how to get it, Next month in July, Chrome's going to start flagging every site without HTTPS as not secure. It doesn't matter whether there's a credit card field or a password field or not. It's just like, hey, not secure. So, uh, so that's going to be a really significant thing as well. So anyhow, bottom line is, I thought this, this is stupid. HTTPS is easy. I wonder if someone's got the domain, httpsiseasy.com. And they didn't. <laughs> but someone does now because I've put a website there. And what I decided to do is go, let's make this just the, like, what is the most stupidly simple, easy thing I can think of in order to explain how to do HTTPS? So I created four videos on average of five minutes each. Some of them are like four minutes 30, some of them are like five minutes 30. Short videos. And what they talk about is how to get HTTPS as easily as possible. Now I'm gonna talk briefly about these four videos and I would love you to share this with people who need help getting this on their site. So part one was just adding HTTPS. This uses Cloudflare. Cloudflare is the easiest possible way to get HTTPS. And I know I had some people pop up later on, they said, well, actually it's not so hard using Let's Encrypt. You just need an Acme client and you can get CertBot and you can run the command on your, <laughs> and it's like, hang on. The, the sorts of people who really need this are usually not that sophisticated and I think we as an industry lose sight of where the technology bar frequently is. And as soon as you start talking about getting Acme clients and the role of Let's Encrypt and automatic renewals and cron jobs and things like that, a huge chunk of people are going to tune out. And I'm going to come back again to why I use Cloudflare in just a moment. So I wanted to use Cloudflare. So this is basically like go to Cloudflare, new site, put in your domain, DNS lookup, comes back, it says this is right, put your name servers there go and have a few beers, come back later on when DNS is done, 
and then that's it. Turn on HTTPS only, which is just a toggle on the Cloudflare website, and we're done. That was done in less than five minutes, the entire video, other than the bit in the middle where you go and have beer while you wait for DNS to propagate. So super, 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 super simple. And I really hope people, even if they just do that first step, right? Now they've got HTTPS on their site. The bit about redirecting all requests to HTTPS on Cloudflare is important because this is something you don't get from a CA alone. I love Let's Encrypt. I love what they're doing. I use Let's Encrypt on some of my sites. They're fantastic. But it's not necessarily going to solve the problem of redirecting everyone to HTTPS. You're going to have to 301 in there somewhere, and that's going to be done at an application level. So Cloudflare allows you to do that because they're, they're controlling the flow of traffic. So they can say, hey, look, there's an HTTP request come in, respond from the edge with a 301, job done, never have to touch the code on the site. So that's number one. Number two, optimizing HTTPS. And what I really wanted to talk about here was how to get all of the like really fundamentally important stuff set up beyond just serving traffic over the secure scheme. For example, HSTS. HSTS is really important, and when we use Cloudflare, there's a toggle. You go in there and you say, turn on, HT turn on HSTS, include subdomains, preload, here's my max age. Go to hstspreload.org, plug it in there, job done, that's going to get hard-coded into the browser now. So simple. Uh, so there's that. I've also gone through and said, look, uh, here's how to require at least TLS 1.2. Incidentally, PCI is uh, deprecating support for TLS 1.0 and I think 1.1 1 .1 as well. They're a little bit vague because they say modern TLS. They're deprecating support, let me see, in about three days from now, which would be cool. So uh, use TLS 1.2. And again, the neat thing about Cloudflare is it is a toggle. You go in there, there's a drop down list. 1.2, job done. You're not manually configuring anything on the server. That's why Cloudflare is so awesome for doing this. Incidentally, in case you're thinking, wow, Cloudflare must have paid you a lot of money for this, Cloudflare didn't know about this until I published it. So I did say that in the blog post, this is not a commercial thing, it's just that this is the right thing to do, and I mentioned the itch. Uh, so TLS, um, enabling TLS uh, 1.3, which is on by default in Cloudflare as well, which is cool. Uh, and then I went and did an SSL labs test with an Aussie bank, which scored like a B. Uh, the new site, httpsiseasy.com, scored an A+. So I wanted to kind of make the point that not only is it easy, but in terms of your TLS implementation, you can do it better than a bank does. So that was cool. That's part two. Part three, insecure references, because the problem you got now is... You've got all of these different websites which are getting HTTPS, but then they've got HTTP references within them. They've got references to images, which will load anyway and then take away your positive visual indicators, their passive content. References to scripts. They won't load. You'll get a little shield and a cross through it. They're active content. They'll be blocked. Plus, you've got references out to things like other links over HTTP. Now, I'm just checking something on my Cloudflare dashboard because I want to get the right nomenclature here. So the, nomen nomen <laughs> the word jet lag that I'm looking for here is um, there are two things that I do in this part three on fixing and secure references. One is I put a content security policy on the page via meta tag. Now I did this with meta tag because meta tag is much easier in say blogging platforms where you can control the HTML. Ideally, you'd put your content security policy in a response header, harder problem to solve for the masses. So remember who this is targeting. This is like the mums and dads running a coffee shop and they've got a coffee shop web page. And it doesn't take credit cards or anything like that, but we still want it over HTTPS. So upgrade and secure requests, that will ensure anything on the page, either the page itself or dependencies downstream of it. You embed, say, a good example happened to my blog, embed discuss over HTTPS, and then somewhere down the chain of requests they make, they make an HTTP request, upgrade and secure requests will fix that. The Cloudflare one I was checking the word for was automatic HTTPS rewrites. And what this does is, again, it's a toggle. It's like literally just a click. There's only one click. There's not even a save button. <laughs> you just click the toggle. And what it does 
is it actually changes on the fly as the traffic comes through one of their edge nodes any HTTP references to HTTPS so long as the resource supports it. So what that means is, is that even if you put your scripts and your images and things like this in over HTTP, upgrade insecure requests, when that HTTP request loads in the browser, it will say, turn it into HTTPS. Sorry, there's a leaf blower or something out there. Anyway, turn it into HTTPS, upgrade insecure, uh, the automatic HTTPS rewrites, that will actually change the HTML source so that it comes through as HTTPS to begin with. It will also change things like hyperlinks to insecure schemes to the secure scheme. So I put a hyperlink on the page linking to HTTP, troyhunt.com, Cloudflare rewrote that to HTTPS because it checked that troyhunt.com can support HTTPS. Yes, it can upgrade the scheme. You want both of these turned on because they do slightly different things. Upgrade insecure requests will apply to the discuss example, like down into someone else's uh, request pipeline. The automatic, automatic HTTP, oh, I don't know why I'm struggling with this term. Automatic HTTPS rewrites will make sure that things like external links will be upgraded to secure requests, which upgrade insecure requests won't do. So you turn both of these on. Now, last bit was encrypting everything. And I, I sort of lamented doing this last video. Uh, and and the, the main reason I lamented it is that this talks about encrypting the transport layer between the Cloudflare Edge node and the origin server. This is a hard concept for the demographic that I'm targeting with this. And again, let's not lose track of how much understanding most people actually have about the way the internet works. This is a strange concept for them. So th that was my hesitation. The reason I did it is I feel that it just would have been incomplete if I didn't acknowledge that just turning HTTPS on at Cloudflare doesn't give you encryption all the way. Now, many people get upset about this. We've had the discussion about how people on the internet get upset. They get upset about the fact that you can see the padlock and not have the entire transport layer secured. I've got a link in this blog post to effectively pragmatic security. So using a bit of common sense about uh, what we get upset about. And I sort of made the point that, look, the, the biggest worry we have uh, on the transport layer where we need HTTPS is between the client and Cloudflare. That's where we're worried about cafe Wi-Fi, hotels intercepting you, Wi-Fi pineapples, DNS hijacking, all the sort of stuff that is most likely going to happen to the most people. And then the back channel sort of between Cloudflare and the origin server, this is like, tier one ISPs, NSA, like I'm not worried about that for my blog or the mum and dad coffee shop. But be that as it may, we want to secure every segment of the network as best as we possibly can. So that's what I do in the last part, encrypting everything. And unfortunately, that also meant that I had to go and grab OpenSSL and compile the, uh, the public and private keys uh, up into a PE pfx file and then upload the pfx into azure and bind it to the host name i tried to make it look as easy as possible but I, I hope you can see my hesitation as to why i was worried about doing that module but i think i had to do it anyway so that is now over at httpseasy.com that is getting a heap of positive traction at the moment i hope this remains the go-to resource for getting people up to speed on https and certainly not every site is this simple, like let's be fair about it. But the vast majority of sites in that smaller category will be able to go and do this, turn on HTTPS, super simple. So please share that. When you see people not using HTTPS and they really should, be sympathetic because for many of them it is, uh, it is a thing that they don't understand. Send them over to here, hopefully it'll sort them out. All right, so that was a really important thing. Now. Last thing, and I'm just trying to find my link to this as well. My uh, sponsor this week is DigiCert. Now, I want to talk about DigiCert for a moment because they're kind of interesting at the moment. So DigiCert, uh, they're plugging IoT device security at the moment. So one of the things they're talking a lot about is we've got all of these IoT devices. We want to have HTTPS to the IoT devices, and they're doing a lot of work around that. So that's the context of this week's sponsorship, and I appreciate what they're doing there. I also appreciate some announcements they came out with just recently. And this is the kind of off topic, not 
sponsorship related thing, but newsworthy. And since their names on my blog, I'm going to talk about it. So a couple of weeks ago, June 15, uh, they issued, and I'm reading the announcement here, a notice of withdrawal from the CA Security Council. And they said, uh, DigiCert is electing to withdraw from the CA Security Council as we believe CASC, CA Security Council, is moving in a direction that DigiCert does not support. Specifically, and then they have several reasons. And the, the ones that really sort of stuck out at me is they said, uh, we think that the recent primary focus on phishing does not fulfill the purpose for which CASC was created. And there's a lot of really interesting discussions about what role a CA has around phishing at the moment. And look, my my personal belief is that I don't think they do really have a role. You know, we're tackling phishing through all sorts of other mechanisms. And, and the, the only role that a CA would really have to play there, the only practical role is revoking certs used on phishing sites. And, you know, I've had a lot of debates before in the public space about, uh, particularly about commercial CAs pushing EV as a defense for phishing, which it just simply doesn't do. I've been very vocal about this, along with Scott Helm as well. And you can find many, many things I've written on that. So I was, I was sort of very happy to see DigiCert say, look, this, this focus on, on the role of the CA in phishing is starting to get a little bit off track. So that was good. And then to, to the effect of EV, the next point here is, although DigiCert supports EV certificates and strongly believes in the value of identity provided by CAs, we believe security is an evolving landscape and would like to improve EV certificates in a meaningful way. Now, they're not specific here about what they mean, but if I was to speculate, <laughs> one, of the, one of the things that, that I'm really worried about in terms of, of EV and phishing is the way the likes of Entrust, for example, have positioned it. So I think Scott and I actually spoke about this when he was here on the Gold Coast for NDC Security six weeks or something ago. Uh, and the Entrust uh, CEO had just done a presentation at, at an event and had a slide about things like, you know, it is known that EV uh, reduces phishing or prevents phishing, which is just like, no, it's, it's, it's not, that's not how it works. And then they had stats around things like, look at how many sites with, a, with an EV cert or an OV cert had phishing attacks, like just about none. Look at DV, it's a heap. And it's just kind of like, so, so, so what you're saying is that the certificates that we have the most of have the most phishing attacks. And the certificates on sites where the certificate is hard to get has the least phishing attacks. It's like... So, <laughs> what is surprising about this? And not only that, but just because you don't see many phishing attacks on a site with an EV cert doesn't really change the fact that someone doing a phishing attack will just go and get a DV cert and someone will go to the site and it will say secure and there'll be a green padlock and they'll trust it anyway. So the fact that the primary legitimate website has an EV cert in no way changes the fact that you'll get phishing attacks with a DV cert. Like it just, it was just an absolutely nonsensical bullshit set of reasoning. Uh, and we we saw Ryan Sleavy from Google in particular, like really pull this thing apart and just go, look, this just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So anyway, bottom line there is it's really interesting to see the way DigiCert are positioning themselves. I'm not just saying this because they're my sponsor this week. Uh, this is a really interesting piece that they've, they've written here. I shared it a, a couple of weeks ago uh, when they announced it, but I thought today was sort of a good time to put it in context. So I'm glad to see a commercial CA saying, hang on a second, there's a couple of things here that we're, we're just getting off track on that we need to do differently. My gut feel is that I reckon over the coming months, as visual indicators in browsers become deprecated for EV, so we know, for example, that in iOS 12, which will hit in September, Safari no longer shows the name of the company, uh, doesn't show it already with Chrome on any version of iOS. And we also know that Google is actively testing removing it as well. I think we almost get to, need to get to the point where EV gets burned to the ground in terms of the value of visual indicators. And then we can all go, okay, let's stop this crazy sort of entrust talk that we're seeing at the moment. Now let's talk about what we actually need to do to get identity verification in front of humans in a way that actually works. But I think it's got to die before we get to that point. 
Okay, I'm conscious this has been a long update. I've got to go and do a meeting. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed the updates this week. I'm just really stoked about all the positive feedback, particularly from those two blog posts and seeing my daughter code and seeing everyone love that. So I'm going to share that in the links, in the references for this, uh, this weekly update. Thank you very much for watching. For the next several months, I will be doing every update, at least from Australia, if not from this very chair here. Thanks for watching, guys. See you later.